morning guys it's me professor d and welcome back to my channel on this video we're going to be covering medical surgical nursing topics they're going to be mixed so if you're preparing for your next med surge exam ati nclex hesi you're in the right place all right guys without any further ado let's get started first question the nurse is initiating a blood transfusion which interaction should the nurse implement select all that applies now guys if you've been following me for any amount of time you know that we treat select all that applies is what true or false so that's exactly what we're going to do all right one assess the client's lung fields true we absolutely are going to do that before you give a patient fluids whether it's fluids normal saline dextrose blood you better listen to those lungs you better be listening for crackles, be watching out for signs and symptoms of fluid overload, such as jugular vein distension, ascites. You're about to put fluids into this patient's body, so absolutely, we're gonna to listen to the lung fields. Yes, true, we're gonna keep that. Two, have the client sign a consent form. Absolutely, a consent form must be signed before blood is given. Three, start an IV with a 22 gauge IV catheter. False. The gauge we get for blood is 18 to 20, not anything higher than that. Why? The higher that number goes, the smaller that little hole is at the tip of the bevel. So if you give a 22, remember, we're giving blood. Blood, those are huge cells. That blood trying to get through that tiny, tiny little hole at the tip of the bevel, it's going to lysis. It's going to it's gonna break up those blood cells, okay? So when it comes to blood, we give 18 to 20, 20 is the highest, we are not going to be giving a 22. So that's false. We don't give that for blood. Choice of four, hang 250 milliliters of D5W at keep open rate. False. Dextrose, that in D5W, that D stands for dextrose. That is not compatible with blood. Absolutely not. We're not going to give that. That's false. And five, check the chart for the doctor's order. True, absolutely. You have to have a doctor's order to give blood. Absolutely. Next question. The nurse is assessing the client's the nurse is assessing the client with psoriasis. Which data supports this diagnosis? One, appearance of red elevated plaques with silvery white scales. Two, burning prickly row vesicles along the torso. Three, raised flesh-colored papules with rough surface area. Four, an overgrowth of tissue with an excessive amount of collagen. And the correct answer, guys, is one, appearance of red elevated plaques with silvery scales. How do we know this? When you see silvery scales or silvery plaques, the first thing that needs to go into your mind is psoriasis. Okay, so that's how we know that's the answer. Next question. Which comment by the client diagnosed to rule out Guillain-Barre syndrome is most significant when completing the admission interview? One, I had a case of gastroenteritis a few weeks ago. Two, I never use sunblock and I use a tanning bed often. Three, I started smoking cigarettes about 20 years ago. Four, I was out of the United States Army for the last two months. And the correct answer, guys, is one, I had a bad case of gastroenteritis a few weeks ago. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, guys, that is when the patient's own immune system is attacking their, um, their nerves, okay? And there's been many studies on this, and we don't know 100%, but what we found is that there is a correlation, and we believe that um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is triggered by either bacterial or a viral infection. So what I'll see on a lot of test questions is, you know, they're suspecting the patient has Guillain-Barre. What's a good question to ask? You know, have you had an upper uh, respiratory infection lately, or have you been sick lately? Why? Because it's thought that Guillain-Barre syndrome is triggered by a bacterial or a viral infection, a recent bacterial or viral infection. Which laboratory result re warrants immediate intervention by the nurse for the female client diagnosed with systemic lupus arithmet arithmetosis, SLE? One, a hemoglobin hematocrit of 13 and 40. Two, an erythro erythrocyte sedimentation rate of nine. Three, albumin of 4.5, or four, a WBC of 15,000. 
And the correct answer is four, that WBC of 15,000. Guys, this patient has lupus. They are already immunocompromised. We are already watching them very closely because we don't want them to get an infection. And here they go with a WBC of 15,000. The normal range is five to 10,000. So what are we suspecting? An infection. We're suspecting this patient has an infection. Next question. The client reports a twisting motion of the knee during a baseball game, during a basketball game, excuse me. The client is scheduled, scheduled for arthroscopic surgery to repair the injury. Which information should the nurse teach the client about post-operative care? One, the client should begin strengthening the surgical leg. Two, the client should take pain medication routinely. Three, the client should remain on bed rest for two weeks. Or four, the client should return to the doctor in six months. Now guys, even if you did not know what surgery this was, you should, you still should have gotten the right answer if you've been following my videos for any amount of time. The correct answer is one, the client should begin strengthening the surgical leg immediately. Guess what guys, we know after surgery, there's four concerns. What we're worried about the most after a patient has surgery, we don't care what kind of surgery. I don't care if it's surgery in the abdomen, if, if it's in the lungs, kidneys, whatever. We're worried about hemorrhage, them bleeding to death. We're worried about the opposite, DVT, them developing clots. We're worried about those clots traveling, going to the lungs, and that patient getting a pulmonary embolism. And we're worried about infection. Right? So this patient just had a knee, knee in the surgery. We want them exercising that knee immediately. We want to strengthen the joint. And we also want to make sure that blood just doesn't sit there. Because when blood just sits, blood pools. When blood pools, it clots. And the last thing we need is this patient to develop a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. Now let's talk, look at the uh, answer, the other choices on this question. Two, the client should take pain medication routinely. We don't give pain medication routinely. Pain medication is given as needed, okay? You give pain medication routinely, that's how patients develop habits. Pain medication is given as needed, not routinely. What are the other choices? Uh, three, the client should remain on bed rest. Absolutely not. We're not trying to get them to develop a pneumonia or DVT or pulmonary embolism, no. It, really? Really? So they should return to see the doctor in six months. This patient just had surgery. This is an invasive surgery and we're going to have them come back in six months. No, they're going to come back that following week or even that week that they had surgery outpatient to follow up. All right, next question. Which assessment data indicates the client has developed a DVT in the left leg? One, a negative home sign. Two, increased left, increased left leg calf circumference. Three, elephantitis of the left lower leg. Four, brownish pigmentation of the left lower leg. And the correct answer, guys, is two, increased left leg circumference. Why do you think the circumference on that left leg has increased? Because of DVT. That's why it's getting bigger and bigger. Okay, and look how they tried to trick you with number one. You saw home and sign, and they wanted you to jump on it, but it said negative home and sign. And even a positive home and sign, that's not indicative of a DVT, but it is indicative that further uh, screening needs to be done on this patient if they have a positive home and sign, not a negative. The unlicensed assistive personnel notifies the nurse that the client diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is complaining of shortness of breath and would like his oxygen level increased. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, notify the respiratory therapist. Two, ask the UAP to increase the oxygen. Three, obtain a stat pulse ox on the oximeter reading. Or four, tell the UAP to leave the oxygen alone. And the answer is four. You're going to tell that UAP, you better not touch that thing. You tell them to leave it alone. Then immediately after you tell the UAP to leave it alone, go check your patient. Okay? This is a COPD patient where if we increase their oxygen more than four, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're making their brain tell their lungs to stop breathing, right? We turn off that drive to breathe. So we are not going to increase the oxygen. 
But remember I told you, whenever somebody comes and tells you something about your patient, you never send them back to check the patient. You go check the patient. But if the the, the, the CNA, the UAP just said something to you, are you just going to leave them standing and go to your patient? No. You're going to tell the UAP, do not touch that oxygen machine. Then you go check on your patient. Okay? So the answer is four. The client diagnosed with cancer of the larynx has had a partial laryngectomy. Which client problem has the highest priority? One, impaired communication. Two, ineffective coping. Three, risk for aspiration. Or four, social isolation. And the correct answer is risk for aspiration. Why? That will kill the patient. You see choices one, two, and four, they will not kill a patient. But risk for aspiration, absolutely, that can kill a patient. So that's going to have the highest priority, and we're going to do everything that we can to prevent that from happening. The client receiving a continuous heparin drip complains of sudden chest pain on inspiration and tells the nurse, something is really wrong with me. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, increase the heparin drip rate. Two, notify the doctor. Three, assess the client's lung sounds. Or four, apply oxygen via nasal cannula. The answer is four, apply oxygen via nasal cannula. And I know as students, you wanted to run to three to assess the lung sounds, but they gave us enough information in the question for us to intervene. There's enough information. Let's go back to the question. They're getting a heparin drip. Why are we giving patients heparin? To prevent DVTs and preventing that DVT from traveling and going to the lung and now becoming a pulmonary embolism. So they're on a heparin drip. Next thing, they have sudden chest pain. Why do you think they have the chest pain? Pulmonary embolism. Third, it says that the patient... Um, says something's really wrong with me. When patients develop uh, pulmonary embolism, they get a sense of doom, like they're going to die, all right? Pulmonary embolism, that blocks oxygen. So yes, you wanna listen to that patient's lung sounds, but why would you listen to their lung sounds while they're dying? Does that make any type of sense? Absolutely not. You're gonna put that oxygen on their face and then you're gonna listen to their lungs. All right, next question. The client has gastroesophageal reflux disease. Which healthcare provider order should the nurse question? One, elevate the head of the bed with blocks. Two, administer pantoprazole protonox, protonox, protonics four times a day. Three, a regular diet with no citrus or spicy foods. Or four, activity as tolerated and sit up in the chair for all meals. When the question asks you which one would you question, that means which one's the wrong one. And the correct answer here is two, that protonics four times a day. First of all, protonics is given once, maybe twice a day. And twice a day, that's the max. We usually give it once a day, okay? It's given once a day in the morning before the patient eats. So you see an order for protonics, Four times a day, you're going to question that order. Protonics, that's a PPI. We don't give that four times a day, okay? The client's diagnosed with acute exacerbation of Crohn's disease. Which assessment data warrants immediate attention? One, the client's WBC count is 10. Two, the client's serum amylase is 100. Three, the client's potassium level is 3.3. Or four, the client's blood glucose is 148. And the correct answer is three. You guys know you do not play with the potassium, okay? Potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. 3.5 to 5. I'm going to say it once more, 3.5 to 5. That is it. Anything outside of that can throw that patient in a dysrhythmia and kill them, okay? So uh, that's why three is the correct answer. Which information should the nurse discuss with the client to prevent an acute exacerbation of diverticulosis? One, increase fiber in the diet. Two, drink at least 1,000 milliliters of water per day. Three, encourage sedentary activities. Four, take cathartic laxatives daily. 
And the correct answer, guys, is one, increased fiber in the diet. Why? Because fiber pulls all of that crap that's just been sitting in the GI tract. It pulls all of it. So when the patient goes to the bathroom, they have a bowel movement. All of that stuff that was just sitting there and fermenting, it leaves that patient's body. Because remember, what's happening in diverticulosis? That patient has a weakening and outpouching in the tract and the food such as corn or nuts or whatever it is gets stuck in that outpouching and it sits there for days, weeks months it starts to ferment and it causes inflammation in that area and then you have diverticulitis so in order to avoid that that patient needs to um, eat lots of fiber because fiber says come with me everywhere fiber goes it says come with me come with me come with me come with me all of that bad stuff that's not even supposed to be in your gi tract it says come with me all of those carcinogens come with me it pulls it all out so when the patient has a bowel movement it comes out of their system and guys that was our last question. I can't believe how quickly this went. I hope that you found these questions uh, helpful. Just so you know, I am now on TikTok. So you can find me on TikTok, same handle, Nexus Nursing. And you can also find me on Instagram, same handle, Nexus Nursing. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Guys, please, if you want to support this channel and see more content, share my content, please help my channel grow. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on the next video.